All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. We are live uh, on this uh, Thursday morning. So a couple things we're going to do a little bit differently this time based on your feedback. Uh, I'm going to be monitoring the actual built-in YouTube chat uh, as well as the Discord. There was some... Um, I got some feedback that, that the Discord is a little bit laggy. Like, it takes a couple seconds between when you type and when I r address it. So if we do the built-in... Um, YouTube chat. I just said hello. If you're here, say hi, and we'll try to uh, figure that out. It looks like a message is coming in. So I'll keep an eye on the Discord as well in case that's uh, not working. All right. Today we're going to look at the rest of this packet, which probably involves new stuff for most of you, how to take a, a proper measurement in the lab. Now, those of you who were in lab yesterday, you may have noticed this. Oh, hold on. Somebody's saying they don't see a link to join the live stream. Let me see if I can find it. All right, so if you go to try to reload my um, my page that I, oh wait, you're not seeing it, so you're not hearing me. Anybody else, is anybody else here? Is anybody seeing it? Yes, Alyssa, I see you. I got your message, thank you. I'll try to get everybody here. Did you see my message back? Alyssa? All right, great. I think it's working then. Um, okay, so let's take a look at, oh no, now it looks like it's slowed down or something. Okay, I think we're, I think we're okay now. All right, so type either, either spot in the chat and uh, I'll get the message eventually, hopefully in relatively real time. We'll see. So, um, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, lab yesterday. So you you all got to do some measurements, those of you who were in lab yesterday. The rest of you will get to do them next week. And one of the things that you might have found was that your measurements in that last section, your volume measurements, weren't maybe quite as precise as you were hoping. Um, and part of that has to do with how we make measurements. So now we want to talk about the right way to do that so that from now on, we can always make the correct measurements with the correct number of digits. So the key to this is when we're making quantitative data, we're limited in how many digits we can report. So like if you say one meter, that's going to be different from 1.0 meters, which is different from 1.00 meters because it reports a different number of precision. And that's what we're going to talk about now. So the correct number of digits are called a little bit. The correct number of digits are called the significant figures. If you've um, if you've taken a science class before or a lab or something, you might have heard that term significant figures. Often it's focused more on uh, the math that you do, like how you round after you do calculations. But where this really comes from is how precise of a measurement can you actually take? And this is limited by your equipment. So significant figures are defined as all of the measured digits, so the digits that you can be sure of based on your tool, plus one estimated digit. So when we write down digits, like for example right here, 40.36 centimeters, what we are saying is that this measurement is actually uncertain in that final digit. These are all significant, but that final six is what we would call uncertain or estimated. So what that really means is when we write down a measurement of 40.36 centimeters, what we're really saying is this measurement is somewhere between 40.35 and 40.37. Sorry, let me move this up a little bit so you can see. There. Um, so 
it's actually a range of measurements, and the difference, um, that's a, a Greek letter delta for difference, in this case is 0 0.02 centimeters. So when we report a measurement, we're really reporting a range that is based on the, um, the, the instrument that we're using. And we'll see some examples that'll make more sense in a minute. So that means that saying 40.4 centimeters is actually a different measurement because it's reporting a different precision. So if instead we said 40.4, What that really means, or what that's really reporting, sorry, we'll keep it with centimeters here. What that's really reporting is that this is somewhere between 40.3 and 40.5 centimeters. So that's a much bigger difference. That's a difference of 0.2. So that's a 10 times bigger range than this one. So this measurement, 40.36, is really 10 times more precise than 40.4. We're at another, another decimal place. So that's why when we make measurements in the lab, we have to make sure to write down the correct number of digits as limited by our device. So the easiest one is probably the balances. All right, so um, you can look up some of these names for these balances. I'll take, uh, you can find those. But these are some different balances we might use in the lab. And you'll notice they have different levels of precision. So this one up here uh, on the left says, 34.70. This one on the middle says 34.699. And this one on the right is 34.7191. So essentially the same basic measurement, right? 34.7, but reporting very different levels of precision. So when you take this measurement down into your notebook, it's really important that you don't round it, that you actually write the full number that's reported by the device. So either 34.70. 34.699 or 34.7191, and we're then assuming that that last digit is actually estimated by the instrument itself. So when we say 34.70, that last digit is generally a plus or minus one estimate. So 34.69 to 34.71. That also means that if that last digit is kind of flickering, you can still write it down because that's the uncertain digit anyway. Okay, so let's take a look at this balance on the right. And what are we going to write down as the measurement? Well, this is an analytical balance. We've, we have the full thing reported. So this is 55.1345. So we're going to write down 55.1, whoops, not one three, or one, not one four, one three, 55.1345. Okay, so that's pretty straightforward. We use the balance to write down what the balance gives us, and we understand that that final digit is uncertain or estimated. So what this measurement is really saying is that this is somewhere between 55.1345, four grams and 55.1346 grams. All right, so it's a range of measurements. It's a, it's a range of um, precision. Now, that's pretty small precision. That's, uh, you know, out in the tenths of a milligram. So extremely, that's an extremely um, precise balance. The other tools that we use in the lab, um, I'm not going to say they're harder, but they don't have a direct digital readout that you can just write down. So you have to decide how you're going to write that measurement. And this is where uh, a lot of people sometimes can get messed up. So let's spend a little bit of time on this. If we have a ruler, you probably have noticed that rulers can be marked in different ways. In order to write down the correct measurement from your ruler, you need to remember the rule that we just talked about. We write down all the all the digits that are actually given by the instrument itself, like the ruler, and then one more digit that we estimate past that. All right, so if we look at this measurement right here, this top one, you can see that this object, this wooden object, reaches past one centimeter, past two centimeters, past three centimeters, past four centimeters, but 
is somewhere between four and five centimeters. And anybody looking at that should agree with you that that is indeed between four and five centimeters. It's not controversial. It's not a guess. It's definitely between that. And the reason that it's definite is because there are lines on the actual instrument that tell us four is here, five is here, and this measurement is in between those. So that first digit four, we might call a certain digit or a measured digit or um, something like that. Remember, not significant. Significant is all of the digits, including the estimated one. But certain can be a good word for that. We know that it's got to be a four. It can't be a three. It can't be a five. It's got to be a four. But then we see that there are no more little tick marks in between the four and the five. And so that means that whatever we put for that next digit is estimated. So I'm looking at this and I might say, yeah, that looks about halfway. So let's call that 4.5. And if you saw that a little bit differently and you saw it as 4.4 or maybe 4.6, that's okay because that's an estimate. And that's, that's kind of what we're saying. We don't know based on our ruler what exactly that is for that next digit. So that's an estimated digit. I'm just going to erase this so we don't. All right, so that five is an estimated digit. Now, all both of those digits, four and the five, are significant. So they're both written down, and this measurement should be written as 4.5 centimeters, not 4.50 or 4.500 or anything like that. You can only estimate one digit past, the, um, past what's, what's marked on the ruler. Okay, so let's see how that changes then in the next case where we have some millimeter marks, which are tenths of a centimeter, in between those big digits. I'm, I'm going to zoom this in a little bit so we can really focus on in on that. So now we see uh, the edge of the ruler, or the edge of this wooden object, let's say it's in the same place, but now we have a little bit more information because our ruler tells us not only is this between four and five, that's our four, but it's also definitely in between this mark and this mark. And if we count from the four, we can see that that's the fifth and sixth marks away. So again, we have one more certain digit or digit that we can be sure of based on the instrument that this is definitely between 4.5 and 4.6. By following the rule, though, we still want to write one more digit. We want one estimated digit past that. So we don't just say 4.5, even though it's, it's about 4.5. We actually look really closely at it and we say, okay, this is somewhere between 4.5 and 4.6, and I'm going to estimate that as, as another 5. I'm going to say it's, it's exactly halfway. Now, depending, again, on how you see it, on, on how closely you can look at it, on how much you can zoom in or magnify it, you may see that a little bit differently. You know, so, so the more I zoom in here, the more it's starting to look, at, for me, more like, I don't know, like it's a little closer to the 6 than the 5. So I might call that 4.57 or something. But again, that's an estimate, and that's up to you. Uh, and, and yeah, Daisy asked, would that only be because it has the millimeters? Yes, that's because you have those extra marks so you can add another digit. Yes. Sorry, I didn't have the chat up for a minute there. All right. Where I see people getting in trouble with this mostly is when the number is, or when the measurement is directly on a line. So it's it's a little easier to tell like up here that you have to, you have to estimate this digit because otherwise you don't know exactly where it is. But when it's right on the line, like, like down here, that can be a little bit trickier. How do you know how many digits to write? Is it 3.0? Is it three point? Is it just three? Is it 3.00 or 3.000? So to figure that out, we again go back to that original rule that we started today with. You write down all the digits measured by the instrument plus one estimated digit. So I can see on this ruler that the, we'll call it the ones, um, the centimeters are the things that are being marked by the ruler, right? One, two, three, four, 
five. That's what's marked by the ruler. That's what's measured. That's what's certain. So that means when we write the measurement down, even if it's a zero, we want one more digit past that. So if the, if the measurements are in the ones, then one more digit is the tenths. And the reason that's important, again, is that when we write 3.0 centimeters, move this up so you can see, we are communicating that this is between 2.9 and 3.1 centimeters. And some tools aren't plus or minus one, they're plus or minus two or plus or minus five or something, but in general, if it's not marked, we can assume it's plus or minus one. If we just wrote that as three centimeters, what that's telling us is that this is between two and four. If we added another decimal place and we called this 3.00 centimeters, then we're communicating that this is between 2.99 and 3.01 centimeters. So again, a different measurement, a different level of precision and a different um, way of writing it. So it is actually important that we have the right number of places reported even when um, it's directly on a line. All right, so let's practice that a little bit. Please leave in the chat your measurement for each of these rulers. All right, and we'll, assu we'll assume these are centimeters. So what do you think this is and what do you think this is? Remember that there are that there is estimating involved, so you may not have the exact same number as other people. But go ahead and type in what you think one of them might be. So we can get a sense of them. And if you have a very public YouTube presence or something and you don't want to type stuff in uh, to the YouTube chat, you can just write it down on your paper or, or leave it in the Discord or something. But it would be nice if we got a couple there. All right, so we've got one guest coming in. All right, sounds so it looks like a couple people, couple people agree on that first one. Nine point two. Since nobody else wrote anything else, I'll just say, okay, great. Uh, th that is a fine measurement for this first one. Again, we're using the, n the measured numbers, which is definitely between 9 and 10. And then we add one more uncertain or estimated digit, which you both estimated as 2. I think that's a fine estimate. If you estimated that as 1 or 3, I think that's fine too. So then in the next one, we can add an additional decimal place in between the 2 and the 3. So uh, Daisy marked that as 9.25. I think that's fair. Somewhere in between the two and the three, um, the second and third mark after the nine. So when we do these types of exercises, the other thing to note is just because this one kind of proved that it was a two, if you put a one or a three for this first one, that's still okay. That's still correct because we didn't have those marks to tell us. Um, so we had to estimate it. All right. So next we're going to look at doing the same technique, but in a graduated cylinder. I'm going to zoom in on this picture here. Okay. Uh, so in, on a graduated cylinder, the technique is the same. We look at the scale and we look at what's, what it's between and, and estimate one digit past. The only difference is in a thin cylinder like this, water will generally creep up the edge of the container. So you can kind of see that here. And that's because of the interactions between the water molecules and the glass. They're both polar and there's an attraction there. If you use um, other types of solvents, nonpolar solvents, you can actually get it to curve the other way. So you can, you can get something like, like, like this.
where it actually curves down instead of up. And so because of that, the edge of the liquid is not considered the measurement or where you take the measurement. And it's because depending on what the material is, that can change. It can be higher, it can be lower. It just depends on what you're, what, what's in there. So we always measure from what we call the meniscus, which is the middle, the part where the curve is either lowest or highest. So if the curve is curving up, like it generally does with water, it's where it's lowest. If it's curving down, like it does with something like, like mercury, you again go from the middle, from the point of the curve. All right, so let's take a look at that, where that is and how we write down that measurement. If you have the paper, you, you probably see the measurement, but let's, let's go through it together. So I see this as definitely in between the 30 and the 40. So I'm gonna put a three. And then it's also definitely in between the sixth and seventh gradation up between 30 and 40. So I got 30.1, or 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. So it's between the 36 and the 37. So that means I can make that a six, 36. And remember, I'm not done because we always have to estimate one digit path. So it looks like it's about in the middle to me. So I might call that 36.5 milliliters. And this is why we always have to be careful of our tool. So notice, I actually, I don't know if you caught that, but I kind of screwed up the first thing that I said because I said 30.1, but it's not 30.1 because this line is 30, this line is 40. So the lines in between them are 31, 32, 33. If this were 300 and this were 400, then it would be 300, 310, 320, 330. So depending on the tool, you have to kind of adjust your scale accordingly. Um, the good news is once you know how to how many digits are going to be on a particular tool, how many significant figures, it's always going to be the same. So when you pull that 50 ml graduated cylinder out of your drawer, you're going to expect to always write your measurement in the tenths place. Okay, so then to practice this, give these three a try. And you can leave them in the chat or on paper. But see if you can write a measurement for each of these three graduated cylinders. All right, we got one. Wait a little bit in case anybody else wants to jump in. Oh, wait, is there another one here that I'm not seeing? Oh, yes, there is. There's actually four of them. Okay. All right, we got some good measurements here. Thank you, everybody, for leaving those in. Um, so let's take a look at, at how we would do this. Um, so when we're measuring from a graduated cylinder, we have to worry about first that we're measuring from the meniscus, and then also that we have the correct number of significant figures there. So in this case, uh, for this one on the far left, it is definitely between 30 and 40. It, to me, it seems like it's right on the 39. So this is where we have this issue of, are we going to call this 39, 39.0, 39.00? How, how do we name that? Um, so we're gonna look at the tool and say, 
Well, the tick marks go to the ones place, the 39. So I have to estimate one pass there, and my estimate is it's exactly on the line. So I'm going to call that 39.0. The next one also looks directly on a line. It looks like it's right on the 6.123456, so right on that 6.6 .6 line. But because that's a line, we still need one more estimated digit. So it looks like most of you figured out the 6.6 .6 part, but we need to actually call that 6.60 because the 0.6 is actually a line. And one, so one way you can check this for yourself is when you write down your measurement, say, all right, which of my numbers are lines? Are, are actual, like, like li when I say lines, I mean, like, marks on the instrument. So the 6 is represented by a mark, this mark right here. This 6 is also represented by a mark, this mark right here. And that means that this one is the estimated one, the one not represented by a mark. So every measurement that you write down should have the numbers represented by marks and then one that's not. If we go back to this one, same thing. The 30 is represented by that mark right there. The 9 is that mark right there, and so then the zero is not represented by a mark. Okay, then moving over, same idea. This one also looks like it's right on the line to me, right on that 20. So then the question becomes, is it 20? Is it 20.0? Is it 20.00? How do we decide? Uh, so I'm going to write down 20 because I am pretty certain about that because it's right on there. And I'm going to then mark my, my, uh, my digits here. So 20 is represented by that line. And my 0 is actually also represented by that same line. So it's 20. It's right on that line. It's the, the 2 and the 0. And that means I need one more estimated digit. The 20 is represented by a line, by, by, those, by the line there. But I need to estimate one more digit past that. So it should be 20.0. And then for this last one, which you may or may not have seen, depending on how I was scrolling it, um, so let's see here, right up, right up here, we've got the. This one has a pretty big meniscus, meaning like it's really kind of deep. So we got to make sure we're looking just at the very bottom of it, right there. And to me, that's somewhere in between these two lines which would be the 2.1234, so between 2.4 and 2.5. So yeah, I'd call that um, 2.4 something, 2.45. So when we measure volume in the lab with graduated cylinders, from now on, we want to make sure that we're doing exactly this, that we are, um, first of all, citing from the men meniscus, and then writing down all of our certain or measured digits plus one uncertain digit. The other issue with graduated cylinders is something called parallax, which is how you're looking at it. And that affects the measurement as well. So when we read a graduated cylinder or any kind of a liquid, a burette is another type of a liquid measuring device, we want to make sure that we're always at eye level. So if you have your graduated cylinder sitting on the bench like this, if you're up here, and especially if you're like a tall person, you're actually looking at a slightly different spot, and you're going to get a little bit different measurement. So you want to make sure to kind of kneel down or just crouch for a second and really look at that eye level. You don't want to raise it up because then you could be tipping it one way or the other without knowing it. So you want it on the flat surface, and then you go down to eye level to actually cite that. And if you want to measure the volume of a liquid, which is more precise to use, a beaker or a graduated cylinder, that answer is always going to be graduated cylinder. Those of you who were in lab yesterday, you saw that. Um, we talked about that with the, with the markings on the glassware. The rest of you, you'll see that next week. Beakers and flasks have measurements on them, but those are really just meant as an estimate to kind of like give you an idea of how much liquid is there. It's not truly um, a, a measurement that you can rely on. The other thing you can see here is that the larger graduated cylinders, like this one, like the first and third one here, 
are actually less slightly less precise than the um than the smaller ones because you get an extra um you get an extra decimal place there. So you always want to use the smallest tool that is reasonable to use for your application. If you're measuring six or ten milliliters, you don't really want to use one of these big cylinders because it's going to um It's going to be a, a, um, a problem, or it's not going to be a problem. It's going to be fine, but it's not going to be quite as precise. But if you're measuring, let's say, 20 or 30 or 40 milliliters, then it's going to be really annoying to have to do that over and over again with a smaller tool. So that's why we have multiple sizes in, in our drawers. All right, so all of those things, those measurements that we've been talking about are the significant figures. So these are the digits that you write down, and they're significant because they come from a measuring device. So if you've done these activities in the past, in past classes where like you had specific rules on how many digits to round based on significant figures, that's because we don't want to um, pretend or be mistaken in the level of our precision of our measurement. If you make a significant figures measurement like 34.70 with four significant figures, let's say you had to do some math with that number and you like divided it by something. Well, if you divide a number like 34.70 by something, chances are you're going to get your calculator is going to give you a whole bunch of of decimals, right? Cuz it's probably like a you know maybe irrational number or or a rational number but with lots of decimal places. So how how much do you round? Well, the answer is we have to maintain that significance. And in this class because there's not that much of a a math requirement we're not going to go through all those rules. If you want to, it's in the book, and you can follow those significant figure rules. But if not, uh, don't worry about it. What we do care about, though, is that you take the correct number of significant figures in your measurement. All right? And so you can read this about how you, so how you determine the significant digits from the measuring device. That's what we just talked about. You can also look at how you determine it from just looking at a number, and that's kind of the last part here. So when we determine significant figures um, in a number, like we don't have a measuring device, we just want to know from a written number what how many significant digits there are, uh, you're going to follow these rules. So if a number has a decimal point shown, then we start with that first non-zero digit, just like meaning like the first number like this, and count it in all the numbers after to the right as significant. So 8 805.0 is four significant figures. Remember, 0 0.0 is significant because it changes our precision. If that were 0 0.00 or 0 0.000, then we would actually be talking about a different range of precision. If, if we have something like this that has a bunch of like um, decimal or a bunch of zeros before the digits start, those are actually not significant because that just tells us like what is the range that we're measuring in, not what is the precision of our measurement. So these are this is still four significant figures. Those are the ones that are measured. If there's no decimal point, then um, we have we also have to be careful because sometimes the significant figures, the zeros are significant and sometimes they're not. So if we have a number like 800, these two zeros could or could not be significant. Um, so we don't actually know from this measurement if we're saying this is between 700 and 900, or is this between 790 and 810, or is this between 799 and 801. Um, it's actually unclear. And so if we're really trying to be careful with our measurement precision, we try to avoid numbers like this. And there's a couple different solutions. In some cases, like you see in this table, a decimal point is added even though, whoops, can't see that, Let's move that up. So right here, um, a decimal point is added even though there's no digits after the decimal point because of, um, so then we're, that's, that's signifying that the one, the zero, and the zero are all significant. A better way to do that because that dot can be lost in, you know, you can think it's a period in a sentence or something. A better way to do it is using scientific notation. And that's really one reason why scientific notation is used, is that we, um, 
we, we are absolutely certain then that this is three significant figures, four, five, or sorry, four again, not five, four again. Um, so scientific notation can be a way of communicating significance very unambiguously for really big and really small numbers. All right, so that's measurement and measurement precision. To practice this a little bit more, you can work through this packet again on your own. There's also an assignment now in Mastering Chemistry for those of you who are able to get access that uh, you can practice taking some of these measurements. And uh, measurement and significance and uh, the scientific method, that's really our first unit. So next week, we'll start talking about some more stuff. And that, that module or that unit on Blackboard should uh, be up shortly. So as usual, let me know if you have any questions. And uh, this seems like a pretty reasonably good time. I, we got a few more people than last time. So hopefully, we'll stick with this. And I'll let you know of the upcoming uh, live streams for next week. Uh, so question, how does Mastering Chem work? How it should work? Uh, is that it's linked directly from Blackboard. Um, so if you go into the regular assignment, there should be an assignment there for um, that says uh, measurements, and you link directly through that. So you don't have to go to a separate site or anything, but you do have to sign up the first time you get in. So let me know if you can't do that or if that's not working. There's not really a time crunch on that. Um, the first assignment isn't due until actually next weekend. So you've got some time to get that sorted out. I've heard that the bookstore has sorted it out now also. So if you need to return your other stuff and, uh, and get that going, then um, you can do that. Uh, all right, so leave questions if you can. I have to get offline now, but uh, leave me questions on Discord or send me emails if you need me. And I will see the other half of you next week in lab. So thanks, everybody.